Hello everyone. Welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com. This is the part 2 of Alzheimer's disease, the continuation of neurodegenerative disease series. So you recollect in the part 1 of Alzheimer's disease, I had discussed in detail about the pathogenesis of uh, Alzheimer's disease, right? So, in this session, let's understand the details of the gross, the microscopic features, clinical features and a bit about treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Let's quickly recollect the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. If you want to uh, have a detailed understanding, you have to go through the part 1 of uh, Alzheimer's disease, right? The link for that video will be given in the description box below. So, if you recollect, we had talked about the two uh, pathways of amyloid beta protein, the non-amyloidogenic and the amyloidogenic pathway. In the amyloidogenic pathway, it is the A beta 42 is generated which is prone for aggregation and they are more toxic when they become oligomers and these oligomers you know finally they aggregate to form amyloid plaques you know and then they also activate kinase which in turn results in phosphorylation of tau proteins and which then go on to become neurofibrillary tangles. So, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are the two most important characteristic findings in Alzheimer's disease, which is what we'll be, you know, trying to understand in the pathologic features of Alzheimer's disease. So, a bit about uh, tau proteins, a recollection of what we have uh, studied earlier. It is the high phosphorylation which results in the formation of neurofibrillary angles, hyperphosphorylation of these tau proteins, right? What is the gross uh, finding in Alzheimer's disease. So, if you see, grossly there can be variable cortical atrophy. In the initial stages, the brain parenchyma might look normal, but then as the disease progresses, there will be variable cortical atrophy. And then the cortical atrophy is most pronounced in the frontal lobe, okay, in the temporal lobe, and then the, in the temporal lobe, and then the parietal lobe. So, what, how do you uh, appreciate the cortical atrophy? It's by looking at the sulci being widened and then narrowing of the gyri. So, widening of sulci and narrowing of gyri indicates that there is cortical atrophy going on. And it also results in compensatory ventricular enlargement. So, that's a normal you know, ventricle for the reference. These are compensatory ventricular dilatation or enlargement and that's secondary to reduced brain volume. And this is also referred to as hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Secondary to the reduced brain volume where there is compensatory ventricular enlargement. Now, early in the disease course, what really happens is that the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex and amygdala are the ones which are involved. So, that's the amygdala, that's the entorhinal cortex and this is the hippocampus and all these are the structures of the medial temporal lobe, right? Though they are involved early, these are the ones which are severely atrophied in the later stages. So, remember, hippocampus, entorhinal cortex and amygdala are the ones which are involved early as well as severely atrophied in the later stages of the disease. Now, coming to the microscopic uh, features of Alzheimer's disease, as we have already seen, it is the presence of neuritic plaques or the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles which are the characteristic features of Alzheimer's disease. We have, you have to identify, you have to look for these two findings. These are pathognomonic features of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Eventually, what really happens is that there will be severe neuronal loss and reactive gliosis. These are the main features, but there can be some other secondary features as well, which includes cerebral amyloid angiopathy and granulovacular degeneration. So, let us understand in detail about all of these. Now, first one is the neuritic plagues. Now, what are these neuritic plagues? These are the spherical structures. The, the spherical structure might range from 20 to 200 micron meter in diameter. These are found in the hippocampus, amygdala and the neocortex. Remember, these are the commonest area of involvement of Alzheimer's disease. So, neuritic plaques are spherical structures. 
which contain okay look at this these are neuritic plaques in the routine hematoxylin and use in uh, stained slides it's pretty difficult to identify but then they are very strongly immunoreactive to a beta protein what does it contain it contains a central amyloid core that's an illustration of you know neuritic plaque which contains a central darkly stained amyloid core and periphery the periphery is actually by the collections of dilated or uh, torches axonal or dendritic processes and they are also referred to as dystrophic neurites okay so centrally you have amyloid core peripherally you have dystrophic neurites they are collections of dystrophic neurites that is the neuritic plague now what is this central amyloid core made up of it is made up of predominantly obviously it has to be amyloid beta protein and also the components of the complement cascade pro-inflammatory cytokines alpha 1 anti-chymotrypsin and apolipoproteins all these can be seen but the predominant component will be the amyloid beta component particularly a beta 42 now that's about the neuritic plates let us see how neurofibrillary tangles looks like you know they are you all know that it is a tau containing bundles of filaments in the cytoplasm of the neurons initially they will be intracellular later when the you know, neuronal cell dies becomes extracellular so they are also found they are found in cortical neurons of entorenal cortex Pyramidal cells of hippocampus, amygdala, basal forebrain, and raphe nuclei. Now they are how, how are they visible on H and D stain slides? They are visible as basophilic site of basophilic fibrillary structures with H and D staining. See, they can displace the nucleus or can encircle them. So when I say displace the nucleus, the tangles, you know, once they accumulate in the cytoplasm, they can push the nucleus towards the periphery or they can also encircle the nucleus you know sometimes you know the whole nucleus is encircled you might not see the nucleus at all let us see how they look they can also be extracellularly they can also be seen extracellularly after the death of these neuronal cells now how do they look they are flame shaped in pyramidal neurons okay look at this so these are the neurofibrillary angles which has pushed the nucleus towards the periphery and then because the pyramidal cells are because of its shape you know the tangles looks like as if you know you're looking at the flame so that's why they are referred to as flame shape accumulation in the pyramidal neurons whereas in the more rounder cells you know they are globose okay they are globose where the filament encircle the new nucleus of that particular cell if the encircling is complete you might not see the nucleus as you see in this case so these are globose form see that's the uh, histological picture which you can see characteristic flame shape you know pyramidal neurons this is accumulation and these faintly uh, eosinophilic you know structures they are the extra cellular location of the neurofibrillary angles and that's a beautiful globose kind of tangle which has encircled the nucleus involving the entire Cell. You should also note that these neurofibrillary tangles are insoluble and they are resistant to clearance in vivo. In vivo meaning when you are processing the brain tissue you know, for your routine histopathological examination, they are resistant to clearance and that's why in the tissue sections, these are seen as ghost or tombstone tangles long after the death of the parent neuron. And it is also important to note that these neurofibrillary tangles can also be seen in other neurodegenerative diseases. It can also be seen in is seen as a process of normal aging as well. Okay, it can be seen in subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Can be seen in Neiman Pick disease, Down syndrome, progressive supranuclear palsy, etc. And that is the reason why these neurofibrillary tangles they are not specific for Alzheimer's disease. So you have to see both neuritic plaques and then the neurofibrillary tangles for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. So that's about the two pathognomonic features of Alzheimer's disease. Now looking at other pathological findings, which includes cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which are nothing but the beta amyloid deposits in the cerebral vessel wall, okay, especially in small arteries or arterioles in the leptomeninges or 
and the cortex. So they are seen as amorphous, acellular, eosinophilic appearance on light microscopically, light microscopic examination. And what, what do they contain? The amyloid in CAA is predominantly comprised of A beta 40, unlike A beta 42, which is what new writing. So, the last important pathologic finding in uh, Alzheimer's disease is the granulovacular degeneration. Now, what is this? These are basically presence of uh, basophilic granules, okay, basophilic granules with the halo around these granules, and they are typically found in the pyramidal cells, pyramidal neurons of the hippo. Ampers. So, what do they do? What do they represent? They represent degenerating autophagocytic processes, they which are involving the cytoskeletal proteins. Okay. So, so this is about the granulovacular degeneration, basophilic granules with a peripheral halo. So, how do these uh, patients manifest? What are the clinical features? We all know that this is a very, very slowly progressing disease. And they, the, symptom, the symptoms, you know, can last more than 10 years. In the initial stages, the patients manifest with forgetfulness and other memory disturbances. Later in the course of the disease, you know, they develop language deficits. They will have loss of mathematical skills. And then they also lose whatever they have learned earlier. There, there is loss of learned motor skills as well. But in the final stages, they become, you know, they, they will be incontinent. They become mute and they are unable to walk as well. But what is the cause of death in these cases? Usually intercurrent illnesses, particularly pneumonia is the most common cause of death in Alzheimer's disease. So, how do we manage? Can we treat this Alzheimer's disease? See, there are lots of clinical trials going on, which is trying to you know, tackle Alzheimer's disease very early in the disease. See, early treatment is the key in the in the preclinical stages of illness itself. Okay, we know that clinically and radiologically, you can still diagnose Alzheimer's disease up to 80 to 90 percent of cases, right? So, in those preclinical stages of the disease, what you uh, what what are the treatment approaches? What are the treatment strategies applied? Is that one you can clear immunologically? you know they have been trying to clear the a beta protein from the brain that's one whatever has been formed you know it can be cleared by various immunologic approaches or you can even disrupt the generation of a beta protein itself by various pharmacologic approaches okay so these are the available treatment modalities as of now but then the million dollar question is whether we can completely cure alzheimer's disease as of now I'm afraid it's not. This is an area of uh, intense research. Clinical trials are going on. Various pharmacotherapeutic measures are going on. Only time will tell. So that's all about uh, part two of Alzheimer's disease. We have discussed gross microscopy, clinical features, and a bit about uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, please do comment. Don't forget to subscribe if you find this video, if you find this channel useful to you. And please do share. Before I leave, I wish each one of you a very happy new year 2024. Thank you.